Welcome to the Gentle Birth Podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Donegan. I'm a midwife, mom, and founder of Gentle Birth. Join me to hear inspiring, uplifting birth stories, learn helpful tips, and get advice from parents and professionals supporting you on your journey to parenthood. Your positive birth begins here. Welcome to today's Gentle Birth Podcast. I have a very special guest this week. Uh, We're going to meet Alex Roberts from South Carolina. Alex is going to talk to us about the topic of free birth or unassisted childbirth. I'm sure, and there's, I know there's various terms, but it's it's definitely not home birth. This is planned unassisted birth without a medical provider with you. And I'm really curious to hear all about why someone makes this decision, especially coming from uh, from the standpoint of a midwife and. A lot of it I can absolutely understand when we see what's happening kind of within our hospitals and the lack of autonomy for for women in birth. I'm going to hand it over to Alex and I've got lots of questions to ask. Tell us a little bit about your family and where you're based. Okay, so I'm in South Carolina, like you said. I have three children and I'm actually expecting my fourth soon. Wonderful. Uh, um, I'm um, an artist. I do a lot of mixed media art as well. With my first daughter, I kind of went, I went the hospital route and had a pretty traumatic experience. Uh, In my case in South Carolina, I was in kind of a rural area and my options, I realized my options were pretty limited after looking into finding a midwife and I wasn't able to find anybody in my area and I checked around and found a local birth center, but they were also full, so they didn't have any um, any more openings for any women at the time. And so my next option was to go the hospital route. I still was, you know, weary of that, having been somebody who wanted to, you know, initially really have a home birth with a midwife. Uh, I So I found a women's center that their whole thing was, we're all women, so we know how it is. You know, that experience was not the best. <laughs> uh, they did, you know, the normal tests and checkups and prenatals and all that. And I didn't meet the OBs until really late in my pregnancy. I'm not sure why. I, I don't know what happened there. It was just like one day I was leaving and making my next appointment. And they were like, oh, well, you haven't met the doctors yet. So we should probably get that in <laughs> at some point. And I really yeah. loved all the the other staff that I had met, they were really great. And it was like, oh, well, can they just be, a, <laughs> you know, can they just be at my birth? Because I really like this lady. And she's been at all of my, uh, you know, all of my appointments. And, you know, I don't know, who are these other people? And I don't remember exactly how far along I was at that time, because this was like eight years ago. But it was, it was the whole thing was just kind of odd. So I went on to meet them. There were, I believe, three you know, the first few that I met seemed pretty, you know, average, down to earth, almost, one was almost kind of like a old hippie, hippie-ish <laughs> lady, and she seemed like someone I might have meshed well with, but then I got one who, you just got this vibe about her, and just the way she spoke about things, uh, that she was a trained surgeon, and that's what she liked to do, she liked to do surgery, she didn't really seem to believe in what I did when it came to my birth because I did give them a birth plan or, or wishes, wish list, whatever you want to call it. And her reaction to it just felt odd to me. She was like, oh, we support this and this and this. and But, you know, some women just want to go out into the bean fields and, ha- you know, out there all day and have their babies. And I was just thinking, well, yeah, <laughs> that sounds great to me. I'd love to just, you know, let the process move along as it's, as it, as it's meant to. Uh, we actually left the appointment that day, and we said as we were walking out to the car, this lady's going to try to give me a C-section. I mean, you could just, you could tell that she just, she, she was about doing surgery. She really was. And even though she said she had trained with midwives, you know, that she supported these things, it was clear in her other, you know, words and actions that that wasn't completely honest. What happened during your first birth experience that drove you to birth unassisted then for your subsequent babies? With my first, I still wanted to have the hands-off natural experience. 
what I didn't know at the time is when you go into a hospital, they have certain protocols and, uh, you know, and they're used to doing things a certain way. So I initially thought I could go in and be left alone. Why not? You know, I would let them do their monitoring and, uh, you know, but I, I, there was no reason that I couldn't have a beautiful natural birth. You know, I was healthy, the pregnancy, everything was fine. I actually had an appointment the day that labor started. We were um, going to go anyways, but my labor started that morning, woke up, heard like a little pop, <laughs> which I've heard other women say. It wasn't like, you know, my waters broke completely. It was just like this odd little pop that kind of woke me up. And, um, you know, I'd never been in labor before, so I wasn't entirely sure. I just kind of, you know, got up, did breakfast, uh, checked some things, went to the bathroom, and uh, went to the bathroom, checked some things, and I realized that I'm probably in labor, so I made myself a nice breakfast, and um, my partner started giving me a little massage, and then things started flowing a little more, just kind of little small gushes of fluids. So I decided to get ready for the hospital, you know, take a shower, get dressed, all that. So I was laboring at home, moving between my bed and the bathroom, trying to get myself ready, which now that I look back on it and my, you know, pr my other experiences seems kind of silly, but, you know, I was going somewhere and <laughs> so I wanted to feel good and look nice. Uh, so I was at home for a little while and things seemed to be progressing pretty quickly. So I told my partner, get everything ready, get all the stuff in the car. So we headed out. We were out in the country, so we were about 35 minutes from the hospital. Since it was my first, and I just felt like the contractions were kind of going one on top of the other, that there wasn't really much time in between them. So I wasn't even timing or anything. But we, uh, you know, so we started our trek out to the hospital. They were paving the road in front of our house, so we got stopped. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just an awful, awful thing to have to be in the car during labor and drive for, you know, yes. 35 yeah. minutes. And uh, my hair is really long, and for whatever reason, I don't know if it was down or it just, like, came down and got was getting stuck on the car seat that we had already installed because, you know, like, we were supposed to. <laughs> and uh, so it was just, you know, this, like, horrible ride to the hospital. And... Um, when we got there, I went straight in. My partner went and parked the car. They had us do all the paperwork, you know, made me sit in a wheelchair, even though I was fine to walk um, and probably would have had to stop a couple times, but kind of stood up and walked with the wheelchair, too. So when I got to the hospital, they a nurse checked me and said I was about six centimeters, I believe, and we had called the doctor. Uh, and, of course, it was this lady who we were kind of worried about getting her for the birth, the one that I said we felt was very uh, happy to do surgery. So she comes in, and she checks me, and just from the start, she contradicts everything the nurses say. You know, I'm not that dilated, I'm less, and I don't know, it just felt kind of hectic and, and uncomfortable from the start. You know, they, they strapped me up to all the monitors and stuff, so I was... You know, I was made to feel like I had to stay there in the bed, even though I knew that, you know, moving around would work better. So I was strapped up to the bed, and I was getting really uncomfortable, and I wanted to move. Um, but I was, you know, being the good girl, and I was waiting. <laughs> I was waiting for someone to come back and kind of, you know, tell me that it was okay to get up or, or something. And so my abdomen actually started to swell. And the doctor came back and said, you know, well, we might want to think about getting uh, some medication started and prepping for a C-section. And, I mean, it had not been very long at all. When she first came in and checked me, she said, oh, we'll have this baby out by dinner time. And then all of a sudden, when I got uncomfortable and started swelling, it was, oh, we're going to, you know, prep you to have a C-section all of a sudden. And I just, I didn't even know what to think at this point. I just kind of blanked on everything that I, all the research I had done, uh, all the planning for uh, management, everything. So luckily she left the room and said, well, why don't you talk to your partner about it for a minute? And he reminded me that I had wanted to try the shower. And so I was like, oh, great, <laughs> let's try that. So I actually got in the shower, and it was great. It felt so much better. 
my swelling went down. I was able to labor there and actually ended up staying there for hours uh, until they moved me because they said we were flooding the lower level, I guess, somehow. The water was, uh, I don't know, going through somehow, going through the floor. It was just a flat. Maybe it was because it was one of those flat floors. It wasn't like a tub. It was just a shower with no nothing, no kind of edge. Didn't feel like very, very long at all. They got me out, moved me to another room, uh, and then a nurse came in and tried to check me, but I was on hands and knees the whole time because, as they said, my baby was OP or um, sunny side up, so she was the opposite direction of the ideal position. Sure. So they, they and they were just having, like, she just couldn't get a good reading. She had a portable monitor, but she wasn't able to get a good reading and, you know, it's just they're used. They're so used to, I think, women laying down that they, the positioning and everything just wasn't working for them. So that's how they got me out of the shower. And it must have been about 11, maybe 10 hours. I'm not sure by this point. And so they got me out of the shower, come out, and I see my mom's there and my abuela, my, uh, my grandma, and my sister. And they just, they look so incredibly worried and I don't know why, because everything's fine, you know, I, I'm just laboring, and this is just this is birth. That was one thing that, that just really bothered me about the whole thing. And apparently the doctor had, I guess, been maybe telling my in-laws and people that it was like a life-or-death situation. I guess maybe she was expressing to them that I needed a C-section, even though she hadn't expressed this to me again since the first time. So they got me into the bed, and she was able to check me and... She said she wanted me to try to pee to see if that could help things because I guess, I mean, I didn't feel like things weren't progressing, but her kind of reactions made it feel like she felt I wasn't progressing fast enough. She wanted me to pee, so she let me squat over the uh, bedpan, and and I told her that that I could feel my body better this way. I could feel everything because when I was laying down, it was so odd. It's like I just, I, I just couldn't feel anything. It didn't. I didn't, just nothing, I don't know. <laughs> I, I didn't have any kind of medication or anything. It was just wasn't working for me. So I told her that I felt better this way, sitting up, squatting, and she's like, oh, well, I need to check you. I can't, you know, I can't check you if you're up in this position. She got me to lay back. Uh, she, I think she had her, like, fingers in me, her hands in me at one point, and her phone in the other hand, which was really odd, and my mom was just like, you know, what's this lady doing? Just, you know, memories from after the fact. My mom told me about that, and I was like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so then at some point, they said I should start pushing. Uh, like I said, I still wasn't feeling it. I wasn't feeling ready. I didn't feel like I had to. The You know, they were trying to coach me, even though I didn't have any medication, so I could completely feel my body. So they were trying to coach me based off of the monitor. And I was like, okay, well, I feel like pushing, I guess. And she's like, oh, well, you're not pushing during the contraction. And I think at this point I was just like, I just wanted them to all kind of go away <laughs> go away and have it done with. Yeah. So, you know, I was trying to work with them. Uh, the doctor didn't seem to know how to do anything other than have me lay on my back and, you know, do it that way. Uh, luckily the nurse had some better ideas, you know, pulling with a, a, a towel and moving me from one side to the other and things like that which still was all like there on the bed and wasn't yeah. didn't feel very productive to me at all. So eventually, you know, I'm pushing, getting exhausted. And uh, so then this lovely nurse, she says, well, why don't you, you know, or she says, you know, you should let her help you, let the OB help you. So at that point, I think I was just worn out. I was done. So she said I should let her help help me and that meant doing the vacuum and so then the room just like I you know I, I was finally agreed the room just flooded with people like that was part of my birth plan that I didn't want to have you know people bunch of people that weren't necessary in the room so as soon as I agreed to that it was just like a bunch of people in the room lights on my you know lower region <laughs> and her getting ready and doing her thing. So she does like a pull and then another pull with the suction. And I think at that point, someone in the dark in the corner says, you can't do it again. It's against the, the books. Um, I think it was like after three, two or three, I forget. Yeah. Okay, so she must have done three. And then I was like, you can't do it again. 
It's against the book. And she's like, oh, well, I only got a half pull the last time. So she goes and she does it again. Baby comes out. I think they, like, flipped me to my side, too. It's a little blurry now. It's Like I said, it's been years. So she, you know, flips me, gets gets the baby out. And then it's just, like, such a weird feeling comes over the room. is like, panic. Like, she seemed very worried. Um, I see my baby. They take her. Oh, at first she couldn't find um, the scissors to cut the cord. So she was a little panicked about that. They're like, you have to cut the cord. And it was around her neck. And they were like, you have to cut the cord. And so she, I guess, because of what she had done, I, I guess I should put this in there, she had actually caused a laceration, not just the hematoma that's pretty common, but a laceration. So she had actually cut my baby's scalp when she did that last pull. And so there was a bit of a panic. She couldn't find the scissors at first, so... You know, she eventually did cut the cord. They take my baby. I can tell she's not breathing. They took her to the other side of the room, and I just see her pale little face, and I'm whisp- there whispering, you know, is she okay? Is she okay? And nobody's answering me. And eventually I hear her cry, and I don't think I took a breath until I heard her cry. And uh, so then I was like, okay. And it was such a surreal feeling because I still had all the – hormones, all the natural hormones just flowing through me because I hadn't had any any kind of, you know, blockage medication, nothing, no epidural. Like, so I had this, you know, euphoric feeling while at the same time I was, like, terrified and just wondering what's going on with my baby, what happened. So it was a whole big ordeal. I don't know what happened after that. She Some blood squirted across the room. I think it was maybe from the umbilical cord. Uh, you know, then they tried to do like the pushing on the abdomen to get the rest of the placenta out. And I think they gave me a shot of Pitocin and all that, all the stuff that I just, you know, hadn't wanted, nor did I need. And, uh, you know, it was just a crazy experience and very traumatic. So we had a, like a week stay in the NICU in the hospital, part of it in the NICU and then part of it out because they were monitoring for, uh, jaundice and stuff. And she had all these, like, pricks on her feet because they had to keep checking her bilirubin. Yeah, it was just a, you know, horribly traumatic experience and left me, you know, I was never diagnosed officially, but reading about it, I'm pretty sure I, I've suffered from PTSD from that. Uh, it took me a long, long time, lots of, um, you know, talking about it, writing my story out, which I couldn't do for a while after. Like, I couldn't write, I couldn't get through it without breaking down into tears. Uh, and I would talk to my friends and my family, and whoever would listen. <laughs> and I'm sure they just, yeah. you know, they just didn't know what to say, but they would listen, which was great. So that was a great support to have. And like I said, I'm an artist, so I did create some art. Um, and I was eventually able to overcome a lot of things, um, heal, essentially, enough. And part of that was also educating myself, which goes into the reason I chose free birth. It wasn't necessarily just because of that trauma. It was after becoming kind of obsessed with everything pregnancy and birth related. I went on to read, um, you know, all kinds of texts. I read texts from midwives, from doctors. I read studies. I went into all the birth groups on Facebook. I heard women's stories. I heard stories from doulas. Um, You know, I learned the issues with our medical system. I learned anthropology, what we've, you know, what we've seen from the past, what you know, how birth worked on a physio- physiological level, on a um, spiritual level, mental level, really preparing the mind for these things. And originally I had just intended on having my next birth at home, hopefully with a midwife. But as I was reading and educating myself, I eventually came to the conclusion that I really wanted to just be by myself. I wanted to have my family around me, but I just didn't feel like I needed anybody else. Like the more I read, the more I educated myself about birth, about how it's played out um, for all of, you know, human existence and um, learning about, you know, more about the hospitals and how they came to be and how much of that was based on profit and not really for the improvement of birth and the safety of women and children because as a lot of people who have read this history know when we first went into hospitals many women and babies died you know even now women and babies are dying and suffering unnecessarily so and you know that's to each their own it's a choice that you should make and it should be an educated choice and I can only you know tell my story I can't really speak for everybody I can't speak for all free birthers 
But this is my story, and so... So how did your partner feel? Um, (laughs) Well, I actually had... So my first... My husband was actually my ex-husband after uh, a little while. We... that, that that, That didn't last. So... Like I said, between my next two, there was my my next babies. There were six years. So in all that time, I would literally read about birth and pregnancy and everything every day, like literally every day. My next partner, he uh, he hadn't experienced that trauma. So I think, you know, I don't know what that would have been like had I had a partner who had already experienced that kind of you know trauma or had been there with me. So my partner that I have now, he. Like I said, oh, I was telling you, he came from a Mormon family. They have lots of children. And uh, his sisters had actually birthed at the birth center. So when I initially told him, he said, well, you know, what about the birth center? You know, that's where my sisters are going. I told him, well, you know, I've done a lot of thinking about this, and here's your options. (laughs) You can either support me and be there with me, or I'll do it by myself. (laughs) You know, possibly with support from other family members who supported me. But uh, that was pretty much it. And he was like, no. He's like, I'll be there. (laughs) That was really as simple as that. I know some people have more, you know, that they have to talk their partners into. But he was just very supportive. I think he saw how much I was obsessed with these things, how much reading I did daily, uh, you know, and talking to him about it. And I prepared him. I told him, you know, things he needed to know. I actually made him a, a booklet. Um, a folder with uh, various emergency situations, uh, postpartum care, labor, you know, um, care, not, not like that he could, would do anything medical, but so he'd know what to do if a situation did arise. Yeah. So he'd know what to look for in case, you know, I passed out or something. You know, if I couldn't speak for myself or even if I could, like, he wouldn't panic. He he could know, you know, that these situations happen and this is what you can do. And uh, and then just, you know, how to care <laughs> or leave me alone if that's what I wanted or to massage me if that's what I wanted or what kind of, you know, foods that were really good in labor um, and then what's necessary after uh, after labor for postpartum and things like that. So he was very supportive so incredibly grateful for that because I really didn't want to have to do <laughs> any fighting to get you know something that I was very I was very confident and dedicated to having this birth because I felt that it was important to my healing from my first birth and I was just confident in that this was what's right for me and my babies and my family for him too I, I mean I was really thinking of him as well you know having seen the trauma that can happen from interference in birth and and after you know and part of reading and 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 talking to people and families who had gone through similar experiences and different experiences seeing that there's also trauma for the for the partners you know yeah. there's a lot of trauma and and, uh, and I didn't want him to go through that I didn't want him to have to see me fighting to do something that I knew I could do perfectly fine, you know, in the comfort of our own home. So yeah, I was, you know, I was thinking about my whole family in this decision. So tell us about labor. With my second pregnancy, I want to start a little bit with the prenatal. So I just want to say that I did my own prenatal care as well, which just really involved taking care of myself, you know, meditation, nice baths, healthy foods, exercise, uh, connecting with the baby. I got a fetoscope so I could listen to the heartbeat. And, you know, you can also find the placenta and the cord and all kinds of things with the fetoscope. Did you have ultrasounds or did you decide not to have any ultrasounds? Um, I decided not to have any ultrasounds because I also, you know, did a lot of research into that and decided that I just didn't feel it was necessary for me. And like I said, to each their own, if you have any kind of issues in your family that you feel it's very necessary, then that's great. I fully support that. Um, but for me, it just didn't feel necessary. I I'm, I'm very much believe that as mothers that we have this intuition and that we can sense things about ourselves and our babies. I feel like if we could utilize the medical system when it's truly needed, as opposed to going in for every little thing that not only would our medical system be better and less, you know, overburdened, but we would be better and healthier. 
if we could learn to really just connect with ourselves and our babies on that level instead of always counting on technology to do that for us. Like I said, all this is just a lot, you know, my opinion. <laughs> and uh, and I fully support anybody who wants to go, you know, and do all the all the other things. But for me, it was very intuitive. Like, it had to be this very inner and journey and not controlled but trusted in this way for me to heal because that was part of this this first free birth for me was really really healing and lots of soul searching and thought about it all I thought about what would happen if my baby didn't make it what would happen if I did have to go to the hospital because you have to work through those things to be okay to stay home and really have a peaceful birth so I worked through so much so much mind stuff before I ever got to the point where I was fully confident to birth at home and free birth at that because you know and I think this is for a lot of um, people who free birth and like I said I can't speak for everyone but they've you know they've kind of made this peace peace with life and death and I think that's a, an important aspect of it because to take this full responsibility you have to say I do not need to be saved by anybody I am willing to take on full responsibility for this, no matter the outcome. These are my choices, and I know that they are the best choices for me and my family, period. And I will utilize the medical system if I need to and how I need to. And that's what it you know, really means to take on your power and to um, birth confidently. And even if you choose to do it with a midwife or a doctor, you should still try to find that confidence to have, a, I think, a beautiful birth. So, okay, <laughs> so now I'll get into the, the labor part. It's amazing how things just kind of come together in, I think, birth and labor. So it was Mother's Day the day before. I had a beautiful, you know, gathering with my, my mother and my sister and uh, my grandmother and uh, some family friends and just all women and our children at the time were all girls this beautiful experience, delicious food. My sister's friend came and she put her hands on my belly and she said, oh, she said, you're going you're gonna to have this baby tonight and it's going to be a girl. <laughs> and it was such an awesome thing because, you know, you're, you're not sure. Like I said, I hadn't had any ultrasounds or anything like that. So I kind of felt like it was going to be a girl, but there was no certainty. And she said that she's usually right. And it was just beautiful. So we get home and my oldest, my, my eight-year-old, well, she was six at the time, she says, oh, she says, mommy, can we really, can we really have the baby tonight? You think it's going to really come tonight? <laughs> and I was just like, you know, I don't know. I mean, we can't really predict these things. And it was a good chance. I had had, had signs, you know, uh, kind of a little bit of that pre-labor stuff going on for a couple weeks and started losing the, the mucus plug, that beautiful word. Mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> losing it. <laughs> There's yeah, no way so, to reframe that word, you know. I, I, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a great word. I just, you never heard it until you, you know, you've gotten pregnant and, and had babies yeah. and then you're like, ooh, mucus plug. That's a I, great one. I describe <laughs> it as uh, as bloody boogers. And then people get like, <laughs> oh, yeah. And then they're, they're totally Better. disgusted. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love it. I think it's so great. I love using that word too, just because it's got that little shock factor. But, um, you know, so the signs were there. And so actually, you know, had a little time with my partner. Um, you know, people say that uh, sex can bring on labor. Uh, I believe that, you know, if it's not time, it's not time. But anyways, we had our, you know, our, our alone time. And as soon as uh, I tried to lay down and go to bed, things started to pick up. This was about 1.30 in the morning and everyone was asleep. You know, so I just got up and it was... It was dark. The house was nice and quiet. I got my stuff together. I got my birth ball. I got some candles. Um, and I actually had my space. My birthing space was set up on our back porch. It's a screened-in back porch. And, you know, the weather was just perfect. I'm in South Carolina, so we get a lot of nice weather kind of almost all year round. It gets kind of cool for a little while, but then it's hot. <laughs> Uh, I set up my my candles, my birth ball. I just walked around the house and I just labored beautifully. I loved it. It was so peaceful. You know, I was just walking around, squatting, squat, and then getting up and then walking and going to the bathroom. That was the worst. I hated going to the bathroom. I probably should have put some candles in there because I had to turn the light on and that just kind of, you know, 
threw things off a little bit every time I had to go to the bathroom. Uh, so, you know, I was like, next time, <laughs> get some candles for the bathroom. So I walked around, and I just labored and labored, and I, I don't know if you've seen those birth necklaces that people do often. So all the beads, I had a little mama baby celebration earlier on, and everybody brought me some beads, and they were just beautiful, and it's just the most ridiculous necklace you've ever seen. <laughs> it has so many beads, and some of them are huge, because <laughs> they brought me all kinds of things, and it was just beautiful. So, you know, I was laboring, trying different positions on the couch, on my ball, which was great. I loved my birth ball in this labor because I could just kind of get a rhythm. It was very, like, meditative and just rock and bounce, and it was beautiful. And so, um, you know, so I was trying things, and as things picked up, I felt the need to, you know, I was like, I should get my birth necklace. So I get my necklace, and I put it on, and it's just like amazing, warm, like, it was like a hug from everybody that I knew who loved me. <laughs> it's like, it was this feeling that I just didn't expect to get, you know? Like, I was like, oh, I'll just put this on, it'll be symbolic of these things, but it also gave me, like, this physical feeling of love and, and um, just warmth and comfort. It was just un that one of those unexpected things, you know, that so often happen in labor. Um, and I love to tell this part of the story because it, it really shows how labor can stop. So I heard some ruckus by the uh, by the compost and I thought my cat might have been getting attacked by something because he kind of goes in and out and hangs out in the in the yard. Um, so I called my cat and my cat didn't come. Luckily we have a screened in porch. This is where my birth pool and everything was. And a raccoon runs over with her baby. So it was like a mama raccoon and a baby raccoon. <laughs> and the mama raccoon was like growling at me. <laughs> And the baby was just kind of sniffing around, being all cute. And I was like, oh, that's like cute and horrifying all at the same time. And my contractions actually stopped at this point. <laughs> and so then they ran off and I called my cat to make sure he was okay. And he came in and I, you know, shut my screen and locked it and everything and let him in. And once everything had settled down, it all started back up again, just, you know, beautifully, you know, went on laboring a little bit until I was ready. I felt like I needed my partner's help. Actually, I didn't feel like I needed my partner's help until I realized that the hose <laughs> for the to fill up the pool was not hooked up anymore. We had had it hooked up for like, you know, a couple weeks before. I guess he had unhooked it to do some laundry because we had it hooked up to the, the, washer, the washer hookup. And I, at first I tried to do it with like my big old belly, like in labor, <laughs> trying to hook this up. I was like, okay, well, this isn't going to work. So, you know, because I just wanted to let him rest as long as possible to, you know, be able to help with whatever I actually needed his help with. So up until this point, you know, I didn't need anything. I, I'm one of those people who just doesn't like to be touched or anything in labor. Yeah. Like, I just, just like to let it flow. And so at this point, I went in there and I, I whispered to him. And he swears he's a light sleeper. <laughs> But I tell you, I don't know. So I go in there and I, you know, try to wake him. And I'm like, hey, you know, whisper. I'm like, hey, I think I need your help now. I'm ready to fill up the pool. Um, and he didn't get it at first. He's like, huh? <laughs> what? I'm like, I'm ready to fill up the pool. I need your help. And he's like, oh, oh, it's time? <laughs> so he, like, jumps up and he goes and he just, you know, right into action. He goes and hooks up the hose and um, I finished blowing up the pool the rest of the way because I had it partially blown up and um, put the hose out there start filling it up I'm not even sure what time it's it is at this point because it just wasn't necessary to even look at the clock mm. you know I, I wasn't concerned I you know I was just going with the flow so we start to get the pool filled up and as soon as there's like a good amount of water in there I hop in um, and it feels great like I mean, just amazing. Of course, like people say, you know, it doesn't take away everything, <laughs> but it definitely soothes things. And, oh, it was a beautiful, beautiful feeling. And I just love the water. Like, I've always been a, a water person, love the beach and my baths and all that. So um, I get in there and, you know, move around a little bit, um, hands and knees holding up on the, the rim of the pool. And it's one of those, just those fishy pools. And they're really great, nice and sturdy which a lot of the birth pools they sell, they're, you know, like that nice sturdy edges so you can lean on them. You know, while I'm in there leaning over the edge, I feel like this 
strange sensation. It feels like a, you know, a bubble coming out and bursting. <laughs> so that was my waters had just broke, just released. Um, and it was just the, the strangest feeling, like a little balloon coming out and poof, bursting. And so I yelled at my partner, oh, my water's released. And I don't even know if he heard me or not. <laughs> but he, uh, you know, he came out. He was trying to warm water up on the stove as well just to make sure we had hot water to keep the water warm in the pool. And so after that, things got a little more intense. And I, you know, kind of moved position around the pool. I leaned back. I leaned forward. There was like that moment, that pause that you often hear about. Uh, and I just had him kind of rub my head for a minute, and it felt lovely. Uh, and then I kind of felt the need to lean forward, so I, like, leaned forward, and I almost clenched up. Like, I had this moment of, like, I wasn't scared or anything. It was just like, oh, crap, what am I thinking? This is so intense, <laughs> and how am I ever going to get through it, that kind of feeling. And so there was a moment of that, and then I just whispered to myself, I was like, no. You know, no, you can't do that. You can't clench up. You can't you can't go there because that's not going to help you. Like sometimes you just you have to get, you know, uh, but basically you have to let go to get through. Um, yeah, and that's to surrender exactly. to it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so, you know, that was my point of, of surrender. And I just a simple whisper of no to myself. I laid back and she was coming. She was ready to come. I knew she was I, like I just through the whole pregnancy. I had a feeling she was going to come this way just fast and furious because while she was inside she was also very very intense while she was inside moving around like it was painful at times how hard and you know her movements were so I kind of leaned back and pushed but it was more of the fetal ejection reflex mm. than anything because I mean there's nothing I could do about it it was just she was coming <laughs> and so the, I mean within moments I don't I can't tell you how long but it was just moments she was Flew out into the water, arms spread out, little bright red lips, pierced little bright red lips, the most adorable thing ever, <laughs> ever, and these big bright eyes just open and ready to meet the world. It was amazing. And in that moment, I mean, you just feel so healed. Like it's, I mean, it maybe it sounds a little hokey to some people, but I mean, it's the, it was the most incredible feeling ever. And I was just like, I, you know, I did it. And it was amazing and it was perfect. And my partner got to lift his first child out of the water. And I don't believe he was traumatized at all. Um, he seemed to think it was a beautiful experience <laughs> talking to him afterwards. And it was funny because she was in the water and he kind of started to walk away for a second. But then he was like, oh, and like came back <laughs> and lifted her up out of the water and handed her to me. And of course, this was only a matter of seconds. It wasn't like, you know, she was under the water too long or anything so he lifts her up and hands her to me and it's just you know the most beautiful moment ever and you know I tell him to get my daughter who's still sleeping it was around the time that she would have been waking up to go to school so I tell him to get I want kind of wanted her to experience it and see it but you know I at the then when in the you know in it I just wanted to be alone mm. and um, didn't feel like waking anybody up you know, didn't feel like waking her up or anything. But right after we went and got her, she came out and she was so excited. And she was like, oh, the court is so colorful, <laughs> which is really funny because that's something that her father also mentioned at her birth, how like colorful and beautiful the cord was. And uh, she's very much like her father. <laughs> so that was just beautiful. You know, she she got to see at least the end of what what things could really be like um, and I had told her her birth story as well so I think it was just kind of healing for all of us mm. because when I tell her her birth story I told her you know you helped lead us here like you helped to guide us and get us to this point for your siblings and she just loves that idea like she's such a great bright happy loving spirit and she just loves the idea that she helped her siblings you know yeah. that she was able to lead us on this path to to just, you know, peaceful family births. Mm. Um, uh, you know, that was pretty much it. Went inside to um, birth the placenta. I just felt like a change of space. So, you know, I felt fine. Everything was great. Uh, my partner helped me get to the bathtub. I, you know, I asked him to fill it up with some water. Went in there with her, and the placenta took, you know, just a few minutes. Um, I got up, squatted, and 
it came out and and then it was a, a heart shape. <laughs> so oh. that just kind of added to everything. It was like the day after Mother's Day that she was born and then her placenta comes out and it's this heart shape and this, you know, just beautiful healing experience and it all just, you know, it all just comes together so uh, I don't even have words for it, like the way that it can all just come together so beautifully. So then we, the placenta came out, we put it in a bowl and get in bed and just relax and enjoy, you know, the rest of the day. And he told his mom and eventually I told my mom and, uh, you know, had they, I think, I think our parents came over the first day, you know, so we had our time as a family, just a new, you know, with a new addition all to ourselves for a few hours and then, you know, slowly everyone came and got to meet the babies. And, yeah, I guess that's, I mean, about it. There's more, of course, to the whole part, postpartum ordeals that you deal with, especially in a free birth. So, first of all, it's completely legal to have a free birth because, of course, unassisted births happen unplanned all the time. So there's not much they can do about that. I think they try to do, they have some crazy laws and I think, like, one state maybe – um, where like someone who's not a medical person is not allowed to catch the baby, but don't quote me on that. I'm not entirely sure what that law is, but essentially it's, it's legal and they just make it a little more difficult to do things like get the birth certificate, which some people do choose not to get, you know, thinking about that as well. I decided mm, we'll do that. We'll get the birth certificate. So with that in, in my state, each state is different. So if you want to know about that for your individual state, you have to call the vital records office and find out what their requirements are. And I think a lot of states just have a home birth packet that you get and you can fill out yourself. Um, for South Carolina, the home birth and the unassisted birth are pretty much the same packet. Uh, they just kind of write on it, unassisted home birth. The requirements here are that you have to have a proof of live birth and a proof of pregnancy, and then fill out this packet and have, like, your um, utility bills and stuff mm. to prove that you live there and all that. So your options for live birth, proof of pregnancy and live birth, getting a little tongue twisted, let me think about this so I can get it clear. You have the option to either go and see a medical person, a physician, or a licensed midwife, and they just, you know, they check you out, they say you're pregnant, they write a little notarized or a well, letter with the letterhead has to have the letterhead on it and they say she yes is pregnant so many weeks or whatever and you give that in with your home birth packet another option is to get three friends to fill out their paperwork so you have the vital records office send three friends who are not family members the vital records office will send them a packet to fill out that says they saw you pregnant, um, they've known you this long, and, you know, it's questions like that. Uh, so that's an option to get for the proof of pregnancy or the proof of live birth. You have that option, the three friends, for either. Either or. You cannot do both. So they make it so that you have to see a professional at, mm -hmm. you know, professional at some point. Yeah. So you either have to do that you know, you either have to see someone or your baby has to see someone after the birth. So for this first um, birth that I did, I, did, I didn't know about, I kind of called a little late, later than I should have. And I think people are kind of hesitant to call because mm -hmm. there are so many stories of being, you know, kind of harassed and given the runaround. I think it's better if you call earlier on so you know all the steps you have to take. Because I called kind of late and I didn't know my options for the proof of pregnancy and live birth. So I ended up having to do my three friends for the proof of pregnancy and had to go see a pediatrician for the proof of live birth. And that turned out to be not a very great experience. You have to do it within the first two weeks. So very much still, you know, uh, transitioning from those, those hormones and everything. And just, so it was really hard on me to have to deal with that. Plus some family questions about, you know, certain choices we made, and yeah. uh, we did a little too much in my first, after my, well, my second child, my first free birth. We did a little too much. We had to go see the pediatrician, and they give you flack if you refuse to do, you know, anything that they're used to. That's their protocol. Like, I just, I was just there to get a letter saying that my baby was born, looked this old, and was alive, okay? But 
what they want to do is all of their protocol. Mm. They want to do all their tests. They want to do all the shots. They want, um, you know, they just want to do all their things. And I'm like, well, I'm just here to get this letter saying my baby's this old. Why can't I just do that? Um, and one, uh, the first practice we went to, they actually turned us away because we said we were undecided about the route we were going to go with vaccinations. So they actually wouldn't even see us. We didn't say we weren't going to get vaccinations or anything. We said we hadn't decided on, you know, if we were going to do like a delayed schedule, an alternative schedule of some kind or whatever. They flat out would not see us, which I don't understand that because if you care about the health of mothers and babies, you'd want to have discussion at least, right? Yeah. So that was, <laughs> yeah, that was like, you know what? Well, I wouldn't want you for my care anyways with that kind of attitude because clearly you don't care about the individual health of your your patients. You know, that's that's just not right. So the second place we went to, they were fine with it. You know, they did their tests and stuff, but the, the exam seemed so rough. And I was like, I had just had this beautiful experience where, you know, everything was unadulterated. It was just so perfect. And my baby hadn't been touched by anyone else. Um, you know, no poking, no no prodding, nothing. And then I go here just to get this letter and this guy comes in and he's like looking at everything and pulls her poor little belly button down and pulls her, vol- her uh, you know, spreads her vulva open. And I was just like in shock. I was like, really, did he just like do this to my poor baby that's brand new, that's never been so handled like this? Mm-hmm. And her, her belly button stump had already, uh, her cord had already fallen off. And when he did that, when he pulled her belly button down, it started bleeding again. You know, I left there just feeling so violated you know especially after my first birth experience and then you know trying to avoid all of that and this guy comes in and you know and and just feeling so judged uh for our choices as well um you know this this doctor didn't know me at all he didn't know my experience for all he knows I could have been some kind of you know birth practitioner myself (laughs) you know he didn't ask any questions he just simply you know judged us for having a birth at home the way we did and you know, in our society, we just really lack the ability to have these conversations, which is heartbreaking because we're all so connected now through like the Internet. But we simply cannot hold a conversation, you know, and get to know other people. It's like we just want to spout our opinions all day long. It just it makes me really sad every day to see that, to see that we lack the ability to truly connect in a world where we have the ability to be so incredibly connected. And that's the Um, thing. We are so, we're living in an age where we are instantly connected all around the world, but yet the the heart connection, I feel like, has been broken in so many ways. And we we judge before we speak. And one of the reasons I really wanted to do this podcast was to get more understanding for myself and to help, because I've no doubt we're going to have listeners that are listening in saying, how could she do that, put her baby at risk? And, and these are all valid concerns. But mm-hmm. I want pe- I wanted people to, to meet a mother who has been through this experience and to maybe gain some understanding about why women will make this choice for themselves and their families. If we can be more curious than judgmental, because I think when we realize, and I think every woman listening to this podcast who has already given birth, They've had that universal feeling of wanting to protect their baby. They've had that universal feeling of that feeling of, oh, I don't think I can do this. What was I thinking? So I think that I think for 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 families to to be able to meet you and hear your story, maybe it'll open a crack in the door for more compassion in, in the world and less judgment about women's choices in birth, no matter what those choices are. Yes, I agree completely. And I'm so thankful for people that like you who are willing to listen, especially as a midwife. You said you're a midwife, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you get so many midwives that are just not really supportive of it. Well, you should at least have somebody there, they say, right? So I feel like it's important that we hear these stories. And they're all so different. Everybody chooses this route for different reasons. Some people educate themselves, you know, as much as possible. Some people, it's just an intuitive thing, and they feel like, I don't need anything. All I need is my body, and I'm going to have my baby, and it's going to be beautiful and perfect, and who knows? They don't know the first thing about, um, you know, the medicalized world of birth. And, you know, and that's every and everybody should have that choice without judgment, because like you said, mothers are only trying to protect their babies. Nobody cares about a, their, your baby. Nobody cares about that baby 
more than that mother. And anybody who tells you and tries to pretend like you need to have somebody there because they care about your baby more than you do, run. Because that person does not. They cannot. That is impossible. And I actually just had a little experience with that recently where this midwife was saying, oh, well, I care about the babies, not the mother's, you know, choice. It's like, well, then you don't support women because that mother cares about her baby more than you ever could. And you need to just get off of that. (laughs) I'm sorry, but that's, I'm very passionate about these things because these mothers are not making these choices because they don't care because they're selfish. Yeah. It's a choice made because you f- truly feel in your heart of hearts, you know, that that this is what's best for you and your baby. And, and, I, and I think as and, well when we look at even for people who've chosen home birth, because I had a home birth for my second baby and chose it with great intention and research. And I knew that this was going to be the safest option for myself and my baby. <laughs> But there always this idea that if you're choosing anything that's not the mainstream, that you're just doing it for to get an experience. You just mm-hmm. want to, you know, not have to deal with with the doctors, or you don't have to deal with leaving the home and and have this perfect experience. But it was for me, and I and I, I I've never met a woman who has made a choice based on, I just want to have that experience. It was, they had put a lot of thought into why they were making these decisions and who is anyone to to judge them? I mean, if we can get to a place where we realize we are actually so much more alike than we are different. And we're mm-hmm. we're all trying to get through the, this wonderful world with our children in the, the safest way that we feel we can provide for our children. Yes, absolutely. And I think the more that we can you know, help people to understand that the better we'll all be, the better off we'll all be, you know, the better our connections and conversations will be. And the better midwives and doulas and people who support birth can support it because it's, you know, it's this huge healing that needs to happen in the world. And, and we and we need to start at birth. Yes. Actually, we need to start so, long before birth, but, <laughs> but the birth, I yeah. think, is a huge opportunity for healing for yes. women and for their families. T- tell me a little bit about what kind of reactions did you get from people who, who don't know you? Well, with my first, I was pretty kind of low-key about it. Um, I My intention was to more tell my story later on after the experience. But people who did know and kind of caught on who knew me, um, there was always, oh, well, shouldn't you just at least have a midwife there? Or sometimes they say, oh, shouldn't you at least have a doula there? But I don't think they really know the difference. <laughs> the difference between a doula and a midwife in those reactions. And, you know, there was some of that just like questioning, me, what would you do if, you know, this happened? What would you do if like my partner's father said after the birth, he was like, oh, what would you have done if the baby was breech? And I'm like, birth it? <laughs> I, I had, you know, I had experience, you know, um, reading about that stuff as well. I don't think they understood how much research, how much energy I had actually put into making this the safest experience possible for myself and my family. And, you know, what I, how much I knew about um, what complications could arise. Like, I think people look at it as if you're ignorant. You make this choice out of ignorance. But, you know, and I always would kind of laugh inside when people would try to tell me things as if they knew something that I didn't know. And not to be arrogant, but, I mean, I know that these people just had not done the work that I had done when they would have those reactions. Um, Like they might've had like my partner's dad, nine kids, but still, what did he really know? His wife had labor in the hospital with all these babies and that's all he knew. He didn't know the world of other experiences and knowledge and information that was out there. You know, I didn't get too many really negative and hateful comments like so many people do. My mom was pretty supportive. She actually knew a woman when she when we lived in Virginia, she was part of like La Leche League and stuff. And she actually knew a woman who attempted unassisted birth at home, but ended up transferring to the hospital. And they actually did like the whole CPS, uh, yeah, CPS uh, services and stuff on her. And so that was kind of the only free birth story I had ever heard in my life. So I kind of knew it was a thing, but it was, you know, still that fear in it that, oh, well, they're gonna come after you, you know, because you did this. But she still knew, you know, my mom knew that it was like a natural pro. She's very much a reader. 
so she she's a teacher <laughs> and she um you know so she kind of I think had confidence in me plus she was at my first experience uh with my daughter and she I think everybody was traumatized from that like I said my mom my sister my grandma were all in the room so I think they were all a little traumatized from that experience so I think she really got where I was coming from and why I needed to do it this way so yeah not too much in the negative just kind of you know little suggestions of oh well you should don't you think you should do <laughs> this or that and I would just kind of eh, maybe I might have a midwife I don't know. <laughs> you know kind of stuff shrug it off a little bit yeah uh, change the subject <laughs> and what, what would you what would you say to if we have a some listeners who maybe they've it's their first baby and they're thinking this sounds amazing this sounds like it's something that's right for my family and I what what kind of advice would you give them where where should they even start oh geez that's such a personal thing I think there's lots of great resources out there um, I think yours is a wonderful one from what I've listened to so far just preparing mentally is so incredibly important preparing your mind and body preparing for the what ifs for me that was very important connecting just really connecting with your yourself your your intuition and then your baby as well and then there's some great resources i absolutely love indie birth i think they're one group and they are midwives but they truly support autonomy in birth they support all women's decisions um, it's about taking your power and going with that, um, not letting anybody, you know, sway you based off of their opinion or their fears. And then Free Birth Society has so many stories. Uh, I think she just started like a year and a half ago, maybe, and there are just, I don't know if she has over 100 yet, but so many stories, and you just get a feel for the variety uh, and the reasons, the many, many, many just plethora of reasons that women make this choice and it is different for each family the cases that I think are sad are when women don't have choice where they're yeah. almost forced into this because they don't have the options to do like say a VBAC at a hospital vaginal birth after cesarean at a hospital or they're like in my case where I couldn't find um, you know I didn't do my first one free birth but I could have ended up there because I couldn't find a midwife. I couldn't get into the birth center, but I ultimately went to the hospital. But some people, even the hospitals, like I said, it's not a good option because they feel like they'll be forced into things that they don't want there. So those are some, like, I think some of the best resources. And then there's tons of, oh, geez, I just, <laughs> I just don't even know where to start. There's tons of books. I really love, is it, is it Sarah Buckley? She's a doctor. That's the one who's a doctor, right? Yes. I love her stuff because she's medically trained but she also respects the physiology of birth um, and I think she just has a, a wonderful you know way of really getting the information out there for the you know more scientifically medical minded people um, whereas like free birth is very much about intuition and they support you know the stories are like I said are all all over the place but very much about that intuition and following that oh and then the blog she has some great articles midwife thinking Oh, yeah. Just so many resources and things in there. I absolutely mm. adore her. I go to that page for all kinds of stuff. If I have a question, I Google it. I mean, or, I, you know, I put it in the search bar there. And a lot of times I can find an article that she's written. And she just has so many resources within her articles that I think is beautiful. Because um, it's so hard to find this information, find good information and find, you know, all of it. Find, you know, stuff on this side and stuff on that side. Because even the studies we get that are, you know, put out in front of us are so biased and so flawed. You just you just don't get that, you know, in our society. It's like, here's your information, this is what it is, and we don't really break it down and think critically about it. Yeah. But I feel like these groups a lot of times do. And one other one that I really love, and he's another doctor, is Dr. Stu. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of him? He's in I California. Have. Yes, indeed, yes. Yeah. Dr. Stuart Fishburn, um, I've been listening to his podcasts, and I feel like he's kind of changed <laughs> over the course of his podcasts, and he works with midwives, and I think it's a beautiful thing that he can be there to support women in situations that they normally wouldn't have support in at home. So those are just some right off the top of my head, and like I said, it's really personal where you start, but I think that that, so that initial soul-searching and finding what's really truly your truth is a good very good jumping off point and just sitting with that. Anything else you want to add or tell us about why should a woman free birth? 
I think a woman should free birth if it's what she's called to do. If this is the path that you feel, feel led down, really no other reason than that. If you don't feel comfortable with it, please don't. <laughs> don't do it. If you feel the need to have a trained you know, midwife, feel safest in the hospital, by all means, go where you feel safest and do it how you feel safest. But free birth, if you feel called to it and you feel like you just want to be with your family and you, you really want that sacredness of it all, then find a way. Find a way to do it. Find a good support system. You know, you don't have to tell anybody because you don't need that negative energy if you do feel that you'll get a lot of that. But find the support. Find the people who say, okay, well, I'm, I'm here for you no matter what. I'm here for you. Thank you so much. That was yeah. enlightening and fascinating. And I know I'm going to have a million more questions for you now as soon as we wrap up here. But it <laughs> was really a pleasure to, to really get some insights into, into why more women, I think, are choosing to, uh, to forego mm -hmm. medical care. And I, can't, I mean, we can't, we can't ignore the fact that, especially U.S. hospitals, we could be doing a lot better we could be offering yes. more options to um, to moms. We should have more midwives in the community and so that women have more options and aren't, especially for those women who may feel that they have no other choice but to, uh, to be alone. For those women who don't yeah. want that. That's my belief is that we should have all the options, all the support. It's, you know, I'm not a, a purist. I don't think everybody should free birth. I don't think everybody needs to have a home birth. I think it's, you know, really about finding your truth. And I try my best to support my friends, no matter what they're going through. I just had a friend who um, had lots of health issues and, um, you know, ended up having, you know, a premature and eventually losing the baby, sadly. And she did all the medical things. And I, all I could do was be there and support her and, and send her love and, um, you know, information that I thought was useful to her on her path. And if I had a friend who wanted to home birth, I would do the same thing. It, you know, no matter what path is right for you, claim it, own it, find your power and do it your way. That's the thing. And then, We'll have less trauma, but we also need those options to have yeah. less trauma. Yeah, thank you. I really I'm cannot express how grateful I am to have midwives like you who are actually willing to listen and support women in all you know, all all these ways. This is it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> And of course, it goes without saying that there are some incredible OBs out there as well that are yes. that are just absolutely amazing and mother focused and, and, and do an incredible job. So I want to yeah. give a shout out to those OBs out there that are providing that level of care to, uh, to the moms and babies in our communities. So we'll finish up on that note. Thank you again. It was a bit of pleasure. Mm -hmm. Do, do you want to just say a quick word about your, a little bit about your art and, and where people can find you? My art name is Pinwheel Art. So that's like a pinwheel, P-I-N-W-H-E-E-L, and then art, A-R-T. And I have an Instagram. I also have a Facebook, but I'm, I'm not too active on there um, right now. But my Instagram, I'm on there pretty regularly. And I have, you know, I'm always trying to share information as well as share my art. Because um, I'm very passionate about this stuff, about birth, um, but also supporting women in general and the getting our our system to a better better place. So I do. I have a project that I'm working on. It's called Divino Portal, and you can probably see some of my paintings back I here. Can see, they're, yes, they're but, beautiful. <laughs> they are paintings of various women's vulvas, and that project came to existence because I just felt like there was a need for us to be educated about our bodies, not, you know, in birth, but there's so many women who just don't know that we're all so different. You know, we're all so different, not just, you know, our faces, but from our, you know, top of our heads to the bottom of our toes to our vulvas and our vaginas. They're all so different and they need to be loved and cared for. So I started this project and I've gotten a few volunteers to send me um, images to paint. So um, if anybody's interested in that, you can go to my Instagram, DM me, email me. My email is pinwheel, A-R, so that's just my initials, Alex Roberts, A-R, at AOL.com. I still have AOL, yeah, I know. So, <laughs> right. great, thank you, because I really love to get more volunteers. I want to get as many as those as possible and try to get them displayed places with quotes from each woman to kind of talk that 
you know, share a little bit about her, um, either her relationship with her vulva, her vagina, or her motherhood, or just womanhood in general. Sounds wonderful. Best of luck with the shows and, and your art and your ongoing support of birth choices, whatever they may be. <laughs>